Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts always be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Easter so early this year, I was reminded of another story that just I've been thinking about these two stories in parallel for several weeks now, but especially last Monday, this one was brought back to my mind. About 80 years before this story we hear this morning, there's another person who is deciding what they're going to do. They're sitting on the side of a river and they're trying to figure out, they know they've got to cross this river, but they're trying to figure out, do they cross it by themselves or do they cross it with their followers? And this person who is sitting by this river, and the river is named the Rubicon, his name is Julius Caesar, and he's trying to figure out, am I going to cross this river by myself, or am I going to cross this river with my followers, and by followers, he meant, am I going to cross it with my soldiers? Now, you might think that this is, a, he's trying to make a tactical decision, and he is, but it's not about a battle that he's about to fight. He's trying to figure out if there's a battle that he is about to start. And so as he sits there, he is conflicted for several days. Then he finally has a very weird dream that convinces him that when he crosses that river the next day, he is going to cross it with his followers, his soldiers. And the reason this is such a big deal is that river is a marker. It's literally a line on the planet. It's a water line in the dirt of the Italian peninsula, of which no general in Roman times was allowed to bring their soldiers across because it was sanctuary in the city of Rome. You could not bring your soldiers into the city. That was the way they tried to keep the peace. And any time a person would bring their soldiers, which had not happened to this point across that river, it was a clear sign of insurrection. And that's what Julius Caesar had been struggling with. He was sitting there by that river trying to say, do I want to start a war? And is this a war that I can finish? And of course, he gets up that next day and he says in Latin, which I'm not going to say in Latin, the die has been cast and he crosses the river with his soldiers. And it is a sign to everybody in the countryside around him that he is about to take on the existing government in Rome. And in fact, in a few years later, after he does successfully wipe out all of his competitors and throws over the government that is there in a coup d'etat, he enters Rome in much the same way that our Savior Jesus Christ enters Jerusalem this morning. Now, the reason I tell you that story is because, one, I know that some of you know it, and some of you now know the origin of the phrase crossing the Rubicon. This is a place, this is a decision that one makes where there is no turning back. But if this saying was made for Jesus, it could be entering the city of Jerusalem on a colt with your followers hollering that you are the king. Because what Jesus is doing in that story that we hear this morning is clearly the same thing that Caesar was doing 80 years earlier. He is signaling to everybody who will see and listen that he is about to start a war. And just like Julius Caesar, he is starting a war that he knows he will win. The confidence in Jesus this morning as we hear that story is remarkable. I mean, Jesus is not slinking into Jerusalem and Jesus is not trying to do something tactfully uh, clandestine or he's not trying to do something that is 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 a diversion. The story starts this morning with him telling his disciples to go find a colt and untie it and bring it to him. And the only explanation they're supposed to give to the person when they untie this colt is... The Lord needs it. No other explanation necessary. Jesus is confident. He needs that. In fact, this story is so kind of remarkable that 
not only does Jesus tell them to go do it and they do it, we get a verbatim repetition that the disciples go untie the colt and they are asked the same question Jesus said they'll be asked. He's not being prophetic. He's just giving them the words to say. And, he say, and the guy says, why are you taking this colt? And he says, the Lord needs it. Jesus is determined to go into Jerusalem and he is about to start a battle. And he doesn't go in to lose. That's where these stories take a very different turn. Caesar finds that he will go into Rome and he will start a battle, which will also eventually end several years later in him being assassinated. But he will do it with might and with military power. When Jesus makes this declaration of war to the world around him, he wants to do it so that he can show them what the weapons of the kingdom are. And what we do this week, when we come back on Monday, Thursday, and wash feet and eat a meal, and when we come back on Good Friday, and we sit at the foot of the cross, we practice using those weapons. Because this war that Jesus starts and does not intend to lose is not one that he is starting with might and with power and with metal and with swords. And it's not one where other people's blood will be spilled, but only his own. He wants to show us that if we are to be soldiers in the kingdom, if we are to shout Hosanna, He has given us tools with which to bring about his kingdom on this world. And those tools are things like washing other people's feet, not resisting arrest, healing the servant of the person who would arrest you when their ear has been cut off by your radical follower, giving yourself up to be tried and offer no defense, These are the weapons of the kingdom. But we don't wield them in quiet. We wield them with confidence. We don't wield them behind closed doors. We go out and make it known the kingdom of God is coming and we are coming after you. Or we're coming after you in a way that is different. By sharing bread and wine with one another by washing our feet and washing your feet. Knowing that when we have been wronged, we'll just take it like our Lord did in the way that he taught us to. It's a very different way of fighting a war. But there's another difference between Caesar who fought his with might and is assassinated, and Jesus who fought his by washing feet and has the same done to him. Jesus wins because he will be resurrected. He will be glorified because he fought with the weapons of the kingdom and not the weapons of this world. So let's practice this week We've been practicing all Lent, practicing all of being tempted, practicing leaving the wilderness, practicing washing feet. We've been doing all of that because that is the way that this world will be taken and transformed in the kingdom of God. It is not by might and it is not by power, but it is by humility and it is by the grace of God. And it is by following our Lord and Savior to the cross so that we might be resurrected with him in glory. Amen.